professional academic says the pandemic is the perfect time to get rid of the nuclear family. Sadly, even the pandemic has not been able to rid us of loony Marxist professors. I'm Dr. Duke, she's Katie, and this is The Dr. Duke Show. Hello everyone and welcome to the program, The Dr. Duke Show, the only place that keeps you educated on the craziness impacting K-12 classrooms, college campuses around the world. Today, we discuss the fallout of COVID-19, starting with school districts not only providing breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but now free weekend meals as well. Plus, Indiana Public Schools looking to rewrite injustice by raising funds to support students with significant trauma from the coronavirus and gaps in learning. And we dive into some real education featuring the instant classic, Instant Classic! art piece known as Hans Holbein's Dance Macabre, or The Dance of Death. But we start with Rahm Emanuel's infamous line, never let a good crisis go to waste, as a new push is emerging to use the COVID-19 fear to abolish, actually abolish, the nuclear family. Of all the wantonly, transparently, stupid and political <laughs> academics I have met, which is to say thousands of them, this smug arrogant, condescending little jackass may be the worst of them. And her name is... Sophie Lewis. She is the author of Full Surrogacy Now, Feminism Against Family. And her academic work, when I looked up her bio... Is purely is, academic. Is. She focuses on eugenic, bioconservative, and imperial feminism, queer and trans social reproduction, black feminist family abolitionism, Hydro feminism, post geno post Gen genomics. genomics. I can't even read post genomics and Marxist feminist accounts of care. She currently works for the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research. Now, can you explain to me any of what I just said let, let that is try. actually academic and worth studying? Bioconservative and imperial feminism, feminism queer and trans social reproduction. All right, so I guess that would be social reproduction. Black mm -hmm. feminist family, family abolitionism. abolitionism. Hi, this one, I, what, this, hydro feminism. I have no, I have no mermaids? <laughs> the, that's sexist. Oh, sorry. To want your, your little girls to grow up to be mermaids, that's sexist. I think <laughs> my two cents on this whole business is, is that, well, her premise is that the nuclear family, man, woman, and then child, which is a biological necessity, right? We have not found a way around this yet. The point is, is that this is the place, she says, where, all the, where most of the abuse occurs. Most violence in the world, she says, most abuse and trauma, she says, stems from the family. And true. by the way, how would that change if you had two transgendered parents, right? and a gender-confused child it would be the same problem, right? But she says that the nuclear family, the idea that men and women are normative as parents, that they are, they, they're normative together physically, emotionally, that the children they alone conceive, can conceive are, warrant a family structure. Her entire premise is to use the coronavirus to demonstrate how but whenever you're sending everybody home to shelter with their traditional families, you are reifying right, heteronormativity. You are re-underlining, you're underscoring, you're privileging heterosexuality, traditional families. What she would literally like to see happen is kids be sent not to their home unit, but everybody be isolated alone or sent to what, facilities? where they won't run the danger of being in families? Almost communals otherwise. Communes. Yeah. She, you'll be surprised, and by surprised I mean not at all, surprised to learn that she did study English literature. Of course she did. Um, but she wrote this opinion piece at Open Democracy, and she said, we deserve better than the family. Those words, <sighs> anyway. And the time of corona is an excellent time to practice abolishing it. She said the coronavirus crisis shows it's time to abolish the family. And she calls it the unspoken and mostly unquestioned crux of the prescribed response to the pandemic. Private homes. So she doesn't want these private homes. Well, well yeah, let's make that clear. She doesn't just want to get rid of families. She does not think that families, individuals, should own private houses. It should yes. all be government, right? She's putting, she's, she's putting every one of her wish list items into this opinion piece. She criticizes the assumption that we should all stay at home to contain the spread of the virus, arguing that, one, not everybody has a home, and two, private property is already a, quote, fundamentally unsafe space. Yes, let me repeat that. The idea that individuals can mm -hmm. own property is by definition an unsafe place, right? 
Uh, she, this, this lunatic actually quotes other feminists, including Madeline Lane McKinley, who had this to say in a tweet about the shelter-in-place imperative. Quote, households are capitalism's pressure cookers. The crisis will see a surge in housework, cleaning, cooking, caretaking. This is a bad thing, right? It, the crisis will see a surge in housework, cleaning, cooking, caretaking, but also child abuse, molestation, intimate partner rape, psychological torture, and more, unquote. So now you throw capitalism in, right? It's, to it's the all thing. capitalism. Is there an envi- where are the envi- is the environmentalism? That's all we need. It's, um, you know what, it's probably in there somewhere. Yeah, um, so you can see that she's pretty, pretty out there with what she's saying. Anti-family, anti-capitalist, everything. She, get pay, she, she got paid she, to write this op-ed, she, right? Yeah. Probably. Oh, yeah. She works Basic, for a think tank. Works for a which think work tank. Funders, which, which functions on capitalist principles. So, yeah, yeah, it makes you wonder exactly where does she live, who does she live with, or is she out in the streets? Or, you know, like, what is she doing? She lives in, um, I believe, it's in Pennsylvania. I believe in Philadelphia is where she actually resides. So I wonder if she's just out there walking the streets right now. This stink, Not abiding by the safer this at home. This stink, stink skank, oh, I'm sorry, think tank that she works for must be a real piece of work. And, and, you know, the funny thing about this is, you go back a little bit further in this, as yet extreme as, so, as, extreme as Lewis's anti-family, anti-capitalist animus sounds, everything she proposes is simply the end gain of, of, of mainstream progressivism. This is a, an article written by, and this is a, a quote from the article that we're actually reading from. The, 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 the fellow's got this exactly right. This, is, this shouldn't surprise you. This is the end of all mainstream progressivism. Look, the very same things that you can say about coronavirus is the very same thing you you could say about global warming, right? <laughs> global warming is driving all of these things. Every, and so it doesn't really, racism, right? Heteronormativity, capitalism as we've seen. All the, notice that for every single made up human crisis, made up, at least the coronavirus is real, all those other made up things, the premise is, what's the, what's the way to fix it? Radical left-wing destru- destruction of society, right? Take apart the church, take apart religion, take apart families, take apart biology, take apart science, and remake the world in this <clears throat> incredibly loopy, utterly divorced from reality way. It's almost like the Avengers. If you're sitting at home right now, watch the Avengers. This is Thanos. This is Thanos uh, in a nutshell. This shows our age difference. I was thinking back to Mrs. Peel. Remember the Avengers from the 60s? Yes. Patrick McNee. Do I remember he played the Avengers from the 60s? Very dapper. Wow. Moving on. We're going to take a, a look a little bit closer to home, but also across the nation, because we already know that schools have been providing lunches, breakfasts, lunches, and then some were providing dinners. But now we're going so far as why stop at five days a week? Why not just feed kids ages zero to 18? Breakfast, lunch, dinner, and give them some weekend meals, too. Private kitchens, private refrigerators, <laughs> they're the scourge of capitalism. Unless we, Nancy unless has Nancy, hers, ice Two, 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 two $24,000 yeah. worth of private refrigerators in Anywho. the Pelosi home. Uh, we'll start actually in Maryland because they have at least three school districts who have announced now that they're doing the weekend meals. Caroline County Public Schools say breakfast and lunch ready meals will be distributed uh, Monday through Thursday along with weekend backpacks and family bags for children ages two to 18. Not even school age and we're Mm -hmm. feeding these kids seven days a week. In Dorchester, they're giving away weekend food as well and Talbot is giving all the goods on Fridays. On Friday, you will pick up meal packs that contain breakfast, lunch, dinner, and a snack for Friday and Monday along with weekend care packs. Wow. Again, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds Four year olds. who shouldn't be in school. All right? the way to 18. All the way Everybody. to 18-year-olds who should have graduated, right? Yeah, well, potentially, yeah. And then back here at home in Wisconsin, the Shawano School District basically announced on Facebook, Shawano School District will be offering weekend lunches beginning on Friday, April 24th. The pickup will be blah, 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 blah. Each child 18 and under will receive two breakfasts and two lunches at the time of pickup. Please help us get the word out. Hashtag Shauna Proud. And since that has come out, more school districts across the state of Wisconsin have said, okay, 
We'll just give you all the right. food. Because it's funds. It's money. It's, it, it's why not. You know, this is the thing, and I've said this so many times, I realize it gets a little repetitive, but I hope you understand that this is the using of the federal network of schools. When Arnie Duncan said 10 years ago mm-hmm. that we want the, the, the public school, not the family home, not the local police office, not the mayor's office, we want the public school to be at the center of every community. He meant it. You have a string of t- tens of thousands of public Public schools all across the country. They are the network through which federalization, right, comes. They are the public places where your kids are mandated to go, where they're being fed, where they're being taught lessons about sex, where every, everything except really getting a serious education, the federal government is using these schools to move through. And it's, it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. All right, so take a look, see if your school district is feeding everyone all the time. Uh, We're going to take a look now in Indianapolis, where their Indianapolis public schools are launching a fundraising campaign as part of the coronavirus response, which we knew this was going to happen, that school districts are going to try and raise money for something because they're going to say that they don't have enough money, even though students aren't even in school right now. The IPS Foundation uh, is the district's philanthropic partner, and they aim to raise money to help the district provide devices and ensure internet access for all students for the next academic year so that they have all this so they're ready to go by next academic year. The fund will also help with rapid response to serve the immediate needs of families affected by COVID-19, and it will be used next academic year to support students who could face significant trauma from the coronavirus and gaps in learning. So... For next year, when theoretically we will have no coronavirus, we're going to make sure you all have internet anyway. Our job at the public schools is to fund your internet at home, and we will look at the second one, right? Any psychological or psychiatric or medicinal problems you have based on this, our job is to raise money so you have those things. And let's note that Indianapolis leaders have already announced $2.6 million dollars and e-learning funds that was designed to help the schools and included in Indianapolis public schools. So they already have invested $2.6 million into this. How about this? The fact that every district is different, every school is different, every family is different, that means that there'll be disparate impact discrimination. So that's why Superintendent Alicia Johnson says a number of our students will experience the brunt of this crisis because of the zip code that they happen to live in. And she said this, describing limited access to fresh food, the internet, and healthcare in many IPS neighborhoods. She said it is fundamentally inequitable. It's a virus. It doesn't hit everybody equally. Everybody who gets it doesn't suffer the same way. Everybody who gets it doesn't die. Some people don't get it at all. Some people who get it and have no symptoms. And so consequently, this is what she's fighting, right? Literally, if you take these people seriously, School, by definition, is inequitable because there are any differences at all. You think you've seen the worst of the common and common core. They're moving very quickly to a society based on public schools where everyone's going to eat the same thing at the same time every day, where kids will ideally be getting the same lesson, the same tape pre-recorded lesson from the same droning robot voice every single day. Every aspect of your kid's life will be monitored and regularized. And after they take more and more responsibility away from parents, then they will recognize that kids are different and we have to quash that. Because everything, you know, see, every aspect of difference is, is now labeled racism or bigotry. And the thing that no one has been addressing to this point is the fact that if we actually look at the data so far from COVID-19, anyone under the age of 45 has hardly been affected at any sort of rates like those who are 80 right. plus. And that falls with Nancy Pelosi if we want to talk about Nancy Pelosi again. But the fact that we're seeing all of this trauma from the coronavirus affecting our children, it's not our children who are actually being hit in terms of physically having to address the coronavirus. And it's, it's them being at home. Exactly. That's the trauma. Right. And, that's the, and we already and saw the feminist wackadoodle who said by exactly. having the kids be at the family, they're that's being victimized, ties. right? Exactly. Right. And now you have the CEO of the IPS, the Indiana Public Schools Foundation, Stephanie Bailey, said, quote, and listen to this, more than 65% of students in Indiana public schools qualify for free or reduced, pri- re- free or reduced price meals, right? S- 65%. That is not that you're telling me that 65 percent of kids in Indiana schools, Indiana, Indianapolis, public, Indiana, Indianapolis public schools are below the waterline. 
these numbers are simply not fully, not feasible. How do you assess this, right? And what you're basically telling parents are is you don't have to worry about feeling, feeding your kids. We have a moral obligation to feed them for you. The, the insulting way that parents, most of the, I promise you that most of these 65% could have fed their kids on their own. But yeah. why wouldn't they? I mean, you're, you're th you've thrown the gates open. It's like free cheese. Let's all go stand mm -hmm. in line. Well, and if you don't actually make it so that parents or anyone else has to go up to that line and make that call and stand up and do something about it, why would they even try? <laughs> we make it too easy. Of course, we've talked about this before, and C.S. Lewis talks about it, and we talked about that yesterday's episode, how comfortable we are. We, if we don't actually have to face any real tragedy or, or, or suffering, why why would we and remember the story we had from yesterday 50 percent of american public school kids 50 percent have not bothered to log into their online learning mm -hmm. half of them i wonder what percentage of parents are dragging their kids to the school i'll bet you it's higher than that i'll bet you more parents are using the schools f to get free food when they don't really need it than are even bothering to have their kids sign up for lessons oh you betcha well i would like to have some good actual education so let's do that now Well, today, Dr. Duke would like to look at the dance macabre, or the dance of death for you English speakers. This is actually an entire genre looking at death allegorically in the late Middle Ages. It involves death personified and skeletons dancing along graves. We're going to take a look at the dance of death 1493 by Michael Volgamut from the Nuremberg Chronicle of Hartmann Schädel. As I'm sure Dr. Duke will say, this is a painting that can really unify us. Well, take a look at this. And why do I show you this today? Because these images of death, they're part of what we used to call the memento mori tradition, which in Latin means remember to die. It was whenever, whenever you had a situation where there was a plague or a, a, an, ar an oncoming army bent on your destruction, or whenever there was something that threatened life, that kind of like the coronavirus, that one of the ways you deal with this is to make a positive out of a negative, right? And how do you do that? Rather than fear death, you begin to personify it. You, you, you confront death. And if you look at the image there, that's what's happening here. This is the so-called dance macabre. And you can see these were plague victims, right? Uh, this ar grew up around the Black Death that raged in Europe from the 1340s all the way through the next six, 700 years. It hasn't gone away, by the way. There, there, are, uh, there are four or five cases of bubonic plague in America every year. And the place where you find it the most is in India, where we believe it's the origin. Uh, we believe the bubonic, the, 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 the bubonic, the strain of bacteria that leads to bubonic plague, we believe that it originated in India and was sh it accompanied rats when the Indian people sent ships out to trade with other groups of people. But go back to the image, the, the idea of dance, the, uh, the dance of death. You can see in the left-hand corner, the one skeleton is playing a pipe and all the rest are dancing, and, all, and some of the other ones are actually rising up out of the grave and casting off their grave clothes. And the, the image here is, is that uh, it's very macabre, and to modern sensibilities may seem even anti-Christian, but it's not. It's actually profoundly Christian. What you're trying to convince people who see these images is, look, death is the consequence. Whether it's a plague or you, you die of pneumonia when you're 107, death comes to us all. But one of the interesting aspects of this image is, is that the dead don't stay dead, right? That resurrection is possible, that what is dead will rise again. And this dance of death asks a, 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 a parallel question. As wicked and as disturbing as the consequences of biological death are, what does it lead to? From a Christian perspective, uh, it's a beginning, not an end, right? And that when death does its business, it can do nothing else. I mean, uh, once you're dead, death no longer has a function. And what becomes of you afterward in the Christian reality of, of life after death and the reunion with uh, the God who made you, de the more, once death succeeds in killing everything there is to, to kill, everything lives except death. And that is a great point. So uh, those images were a, a kind of bravery. If you were here with us yesterday, you remember how C.S. Lewis bucked us up by saying in times of crisis, we should work harder and focus more. We should, we should seek out cultural and artistic opportunities more than in times of peace to show that we are human and we carry on. Here you have some medieval people who did not have, vi uh, did not have vaccines, did not under even, didn't even understand what caused 
the plague that was killing them, deciding we're, rather than run away from what death is or ignore it or pretend it doesn't happen, we're going to represent it. We're going we're gonna to co- force people to confront it, and hopefully they'll recognize what really matters about life is not biology and death, but what comes after. And that's Tuesday, people. If you like the show, please help us keep others educated by liking and sharing this episode on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you're a fan of our audio podcast, please, please, please give us a five-star review and leave us a nice comment so that we can keep moving up in those rankings. Just another quick reminder, Freedom Project Academy's Judeo-Christian Online Classical School is enrolling right now. We have not missed a day because we give you a live classroom over the computer with a real teacher teaching in real time to your kids. Guess what? Viruses, unless unless they're computer viruses, can't travel over the internet, so our kids are still in school. Request your free packet at freedomforschool.com. That's freedomforschool.com. We are enrolling now for the fall. For Freedom Project, I'm Dr. Duke. She's Katie. And until next time, stay educated, my friends. (laughs) 